Today, I'm sitting down with Michael Howell. He is the founder and CEO of Cross Border Capital, and he's the foremost authority on global liquidity. We're going to talk about what global liquidity is doing right now, where it's headed, and how it's going to impact the economy and financial markets. So stay tuned. It's going to be a good one. Welcome back to the Bitcoin layer. Today, I am joined once again by the CEO and founder of Cross Border Capital, Mr. Michael Howell. He's gracious enough to give us some more of his time today to talk about global liquidity, where it is now, uh, and where it's headed, and how it's going to impact the economy and global financial markets. Michael, welcome to the show. Great show. Great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Absolutely, of course. You know, the viewers loved it last time. I figured we'd have you back on. A lot has changed in the last six, seven months. And the last time we had you on, you really hit the nail on the head. Uh, you mentioned that the global liquidity cycle was turning back up. Um, and as a result, the basically downward price action we'd experienced through much of 2022 uh, would reverse. And seven months into 2023, you really hit the nail on the head. So I figure the first question I'll ask uh, is about where we are now with global liquidity. Um, is it flat? Is it rising? Is it falling? Uh, and where is it headed over the next uh, several months? What are some of the factors that play into that? Okay, well, I think the first thing to say is how do we define global liquidity? And our view is that global liquidity is an aggregate, which is about $170 trillion. Uh, it's way more than the sort of numbers that have been thrown around on Twitter or Twitter or whatever, uh, where people are either looking at just the narrow Federal Reserve uh, liquidity injections, or they're looking at uh, maybe some aggregate of, uh, of central banks. Uh, to put that in context, respectively, those numbers are about three trillion and about 20 trillion. So the number we're looking at is way, way, way bigger. The global liquidity aggregate is, is driven both by central banks. Uh, I'm not going to say they're unimportant, but also by uh, uh, what's happening in private lending markets. Bottom line is that global liquidity is still expanding. Uh, we look at a reference cycle, which uh, is, if you like, a measure of momentum or growth in global liquidity. That cycle it is a cycle. It tends to fluctuate uh, with a frequency of about um, six, seven years, that sort of tempo. And it's currently uh, on an upswing. It bottomed in October of 2022. Uh, we defined that as a definitive, or we argued that was a definitive bottom. And it's pretty much increased uh, every month since then. Uh, liquidity conditions are still quite low on our index. They're about 21, 21 and a half or whatever out of an index range of zero to 100. But they're likely to climb a lot higher. And we suspect that the peak in the liquidity cycle will not occur until about 2026. It won't be a straight line up. That's clear. But uh, the fact is that investors have now got the wind behind them rather than the wind in their face through a monetary tightening. If you guys want to be the beneficiary of the global liquidity cycle upturn, which will last 65 months per Michael Howell's global liquidity index model, then you should be buying Bitcoin. Bitcoin, of course, has extremely high beta. So when global liquidity rises, Bitcoin appreciates in an outsized manner relative to things like big equity indices like the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. And if you want to allocate to Bitcoin, the best way to do it is with River. River is investing in Bitcoin with confidence. They're setting a new standard when it comes to Bitcoin. Not only do you get zero fees when you set up recurring orders in dollar cost average, Averaging, but they also have a hassle-free mining service. So if you want to invest in Bitcoin by actually operating a miner, you can have total peace of mind knowing that it's a turnkey solution all for you. And best part, River has their own proprietary self-custody solution. So all of your assets are held in multi-sig, cold storage, nothing to worry about. They've got you covered, unlike other custodians over the last several years that lend your assets out. River does not. You guys, they're setting a new standard in Bitcoin. You can visit river.com to get started today or click the link in the description for a special offer. And now, Back to the video. Gotcha. Fantastic. Investors have their the wind behind them rather than the wind in their face. I want to go ahead really quickly and uh, I'll actually share the presentation um, on the screen so that the viewers can see um, and we can take a look at this index. We can sort of walk through this just to give viewers a sort of visual. Um, you're referencing the global liquidity index. Of course, this is a proprietary index that uh, you guys over there at Cross Border Capital uh, are responsible for. And down here, we bottomed uh, during the regional banking crisis down in uh, March, and we've been on the rise since, so it seems. Um, walk walk the viewers through what, uh, what causes this GLI to move up and move down. Of course, obviously, bank credit, um, which seems to be supported right now, despite the Fed hiking interest rates. Um, I, I suppose a question that I'll have I have for you is uh, we saw the GLI, it, it remained 
supported even all throughout the the, the great financial crisis here. Um, given the fact that the Fed's interest rate hikes are seemingly just now hitting the economy, um, we're starting mm-hmm. to see you know manufacturing data. Uh, take a downturn. We're starting to see industrial data take a downturn. Today, we had a few sour data points. Um, In your view, do you feel that bank credit will continue to be supported, um, which will continue to allow the the GLI to rise, even if we enter something like a recession? Or do you think that there's a chance that we stay down here um, rather than, you know, continued expansion of global liquidity? Great question, Joe. I think the the fact is that you've got to think about two separate spheres of, uh, of money. Or money circulation. One is the real economy, and the other is financial markets. Uh, what we're interested in for the now is what's happening in the financial markets, and therefore we're looking at uh, at financial liquidity, which is what this aggregate is basically uh, designed to track. Um, if you want to understand what's happening in the real economy, then conventional monetary measures like M1 or M2 uh, give a pretty decent heads up. They're a measure, uh, as you know, of retail bank deposits. Uh, they measure the flow through banks. They're really transactions based. And you would expect to see uh, in a period of a recession, basically slowing uh, both bank deposits and maybe bank credit to industry. But the fact is that if the economy is slowing down and industry no longer wants um, money for working capital or whatever it may be, that will be moved back into financial, into the financial economy, into financial markets. So in other words, there's a flow back from the real economy circuit to the financial circuit during periods of economic downturn. And that can be quite meaningful in terms of additional liquidity for financial assets. Now, on top of that, what you've got are other factors which are coming in. One may be new lending by banks. I mean, they may decide that they want to lend. And during periods of of, uh, economic turmoil, it's often more attractive to lend against financial assets uh, than it is against uh, you know real plant and equipment or consumer spending, so banks tend to move towards um, if you like collateralized lending um, in the financial markets during these periods. And then the other thing we've got to remember is that what are the central banks doing? Uh, the central banks are a further source of uh, of liquidity. We've been arguing uh, principally since uh, end of September of last year that there's been a meaningful change in what the Federal Reserve and the Treasury in the U.S. have been doing. Uh, we argued that the uh, UK, the British gilt crisis, when uh, the gilt market, the sovereign debt market in the UK, the government bond market, sold off aggressively in the wake of the uh, errant budget statement by the incoming Prime Minister Liz Truss. Uh, that was a wake-up call for governments worldwide because it showed the fragility of financial markets and how vulnerable their government debt markets were. Now, this only happened in a backwater in Britain, But had that happened in the U.S. Treasury market, the world would have had a financial crisis rather like 2008 because the spike in bond yields was significant. I believe there was a wake up call. I think that that was a time when the Treasury and the Fed together thought that enough was enough. They needed to flatline U.S. bank reserves and Fed liquidity. Evidence shows since that date, uh, the numbers have flatlined. And then following the SVB failure, and CSFB and et cetera, other regional bank problems, uh, the Federal Reserve has actually injected more liquidity into the system. And if you look at our measures of Fed liquidity or look at bank reserves, they've basically been trending higher uh, since that point. So you've got the Federal Reserve as one marker, which has been putting an important market, putting more liquidity in. The Bank of Japan has been adding liquidity through this year, in contrast to what they did last year. Uh, You've also got uh, evidence that China has had admittedly a stop start uh, regime of adding liquidity, sitting on its hands, adding more than recently in the last few weeks, taking a bit out. But generally, China has been very supportive this year in terms of adding liquidity. And if you look uh, beyond open market operations in China and you start to look at lending, lending by what are called the policy banks, which are an instrument of the People's Bank of China, which lend directly into the market, Uh, those in the last few months have actually been rising quite strongly. So generally speaking, you've got a collection of central banks that are beginning to ease. Uh, You've got uh, evidence that uh, the real economy is slowing and liquidity is flowing back into financial markets. And then I think the other thing that one's got to throw in here is that there's been a significant increase in holdings of dollars by foreign central banks. Now, that may be a slightly wonkish thought, 
But the end of the day, what that means, if foreign exchange reserves of foreign governments increase, they tend to monetize those flows. In other words, they print money to stop their exchange rates appreciating against the US dollar. And that's been another source of liquidity that is starting to come through as well. So generally speaking, uh, there is a lift off of the cycle. I'm not going to say that liquidity is abundant right now because it plainly isn't, but it's moving up from the lows. And that uh, rise in liquidity is clearly helping markets. Perfect. Extremely well said. Great summary. Um, so a few questions, a few jumping off points that I want to uh, discuss there. Um, the foremost one being uh, China's liquidity. Um, so historically, China uh, PMIs have a correlation, uh, have a very, very strong correlation, almost like immediate pass through with CPI inflation. Now, of course, that's a bit trending off topic when it comes to liquidity, but it does highlight how interconnected uh, China's economy and China's uh, monetary policy, of course, is with uh, total global liquidity, of course, and uh, US, uh, US economic, uh, economic growth, economic activity. So my question is, China's experiencing, it's either on the cusp of deflation or it is uh, in deflation. It's facing kind of a, a much more severe crisis than the one that we are facing here in the US, where so far we've had 12 months of disinflation, but nothing, uh, no extreme negative growth impulse like we're seeing over in China. And and um, the growing consensus is that China is going to begin easing. What, what sort of impact is that going to have uh, on global liquidity? Um, and do you think that as of right now, of course, global liquidity is, is rising. It's still relatively muted, but it's rising. Um, do you think that, this, that China potentially easing here is going to really lift global liquidity off the floor that it, uh, it made around these banking crises and uh, you know, support asset prices for you know, the foreseeable future, even if we do enter a recession? Well, the short answer is that it could it could be uh, the case. I mean, we, we need evidence of that. Uh, the problem with China is it's quite opaque. It's not always easy to see and it's not entirely clear what the uh, what the direction of policy is. But uh, at the end of the day, one would suspect that with an economy that is slow and with youth unemployment, which is at peak levels, uh, they're going to have to do something. And clearly, the Chinese economy is disappointed in the in the short term. I think what I would say to put this in context is that if you look at the impact of, let's say, the big two central banks, the Fed and the People's Bank of China, uh, the Federal Reserve tends to have its biggest impact on financial markets, global financial markets. So that's where if dollars are created or destroyed, you tend to find the effects in financial markets pretty immediately. In China's case, it's slightly different transmission. Uh, China, we know, is a very large industrial economy. It has a big footprint uh, in the world. And if the PBOC tends to uh, change the uh, speed or tempo of liquidity injections, it tends to come through directly on the real economy uh, in China. And it tends to affect trade and commodity markets and the real economy rather more than it affects the, the financial sector. So I think you've, you've got to make that, that division between the two. Having said that, China is or has been easing, as we've argued, it's managed to lift the economy uh, to some extent. I think there's, uh, there's a lot of uh, maybe misinformed talk about how bad the situation in China is. I'm not going to say it's good, but it's not, uh, it's not that parlous. Uh, the Chinese economy is expanding. Uh, credit growth is actually fairly decent. The BOJ is attempting to ease. Uh, they've been thwarted in the last uh, two or three weeks by the weakness in the yuan. Uh, I would argue that that may have been a deliberate move or external move to put pressure on China ahead of Janet Yellen's visit there a week ago. But we can uh, we can drill down into that. Uh, that may be an interesting watershed to think of in terms of what's going on. But I think if you if you come back to uh, uh, you know the Chinese economy and maybe the direction, I think one of the things that to put into context here to to think about the the bigger picture is that China has been uh, adversely affected in recent months by the banning of technology transfer from the US uh, and the limits on, uh, on technology uh, goods that are being exported to China. And that clearly must have an effect, a negative effect, on the so-called real exchange rate of China. Now, if you're losing that degree of technology input, and we know that historically that economic catch-up has been very closely connected with trans, tra, uh, technology transfer. If China is losing that conduit, you would expect economic growth in the medium term to be weaker, and you'd expect the real exchange rate consequently to fall. Now, if we had to conjecture what that impact would be, I mean, we can choose a number, but I would say it's likely to be of the magnitude of about 20%. 
So you'd expect to see about a 20% fall in the Chinese real exchange rate. Now, that real exchange rate consists of two moving parts. One is the yuan, uh, the nominal currency, or the renminbi, if you want to call it the renminbi, and the other is the price level in China. So you're either going to get a 20% fall uh, or 20% plus fall in the nominal exchange rate, or you're going to get a 20% fall in prices. Now, what you're saying and what you're highlighting is there is deflation in China and you've got a weak yuan. So this is turning out pretty much as expected. I mean, there's no great surprises going on here. And the question is, is how long before that is stopped? What we know is that basically economies, or let's put it another way, uh, policymakers don't like deflation. Deflation is a very negative force on economies, and they will try and avoid that. So I would suggest that if push comes to shove, the Chinese are much more likely to allow the yuan to devalue against the US dollar in the medium term. So my view, uh, which you know is not a, a overnight thought, but it's something I've been arguing for uh, for some time now, is that the big figure for the yuan US dollar cross doesn't start with a seven, it starts with a 10. And I think that's a more likely realistic long term view. In other words, China is likely to oversee some significant devaluation of its exchange rate over time. What policymakers don't like are sudden changes in exchange rates. So they're not going to uh, they're not going to allow the yuan to get from uh, seven through eight to nine to ten in a matter of weeks. That may take several years to occur, but I think it's it's in train. And what we've seen in the last few weeks is a lot of pressure uh, being put on the Chinese authorities to try and hold the yuan up when the yuan was sort of challenging uh, again the sort of seven point two area. Uh, that uh, you know we saw uh, previously last year. So it's that which has caused the Chinese to actually pull back some of their recent monetary accommodation. Now, when I cited earlier on the watershed, perhaps, of Janet Yellen uh, visiting China, I would suggest that there may be uh, a quid pro quo there. In other words, did the US uh, orchestrate a period of weakness for the Chinese yuan so Janet Yellen could go to China to go to Beijing and offer, uh, we will take the pressure off the yuan if the Chinese agree to continue buying US treasuries. Now, I haven't the faintest idea whether that happened. I've got no idea whether it's a, it's a, re, it's a reasonable conjecture, but I don't know whether it's a factual conjecture. Uh, and we'll see. But I think the proof of the pudding may be in the eating. And I would yeah. suspect that what we're likely to see now is some uh, peak in the dollar, albeit a temporary peak in the dollar, because I'm still bullish of the dollar long term, but I think the dollar may come down. And it comes back very much to our view of markets uh, between 2022 and 2023, where last year we were arguing that what the policy remit was, was to get the US dollar up and the Federal Reserve balance sheet down, the effective balance sheet down. And 2023 is all about getting the balance sheet, the effective balance sheet of the Fed. In other words, the liquidity drivers up and the dollar down. And that may be a very simple or naive view, but I think that's how I would characterize policy in the US this year. Extremely well said. I think there is some credence to that. Um, I wouldn't call it conjecture. I think what you just said actually may have illuminated something that may very well be happening. And this also plays into the Fed's own support of the US sovereign debt market that we saw with the creation of the bank term funding program. Um, it, it wouldn't shock me at all if Yellen's trip over uh, to China, of course, weakening the dollar relative to um, something like the yuan, you know, and incentivizing China to purchase US Treasury, some kind of deal that happened there. It sort of makes sense, particularly when you consider that um, now that CPI inflation is dead, these rate hikes, um, they're really only being stomached by banks that are holding uh, long duration U.S. treasuries. And also the fact that the treasury is issuing a boatload uh, of new U.S. treasuries. They already have begun doing that in order to refill their, their general account, which of course, Ceteris Paribus puts upward pressure on yields. And so with the Fed, you know, the treasury probably doesn't want the Fed to be the only buyer. And so it makes sense in the vein of not just protecting banks by making sure that uh, these U.S. treasuries are getting purchased, um, but also making, that, making sure that the Fed isn't the only one buying them. It makes sense to me that uh, there may have been some kind of quid pro quo, some kind of sweetheart deal 
uh, for uh, for for China to buy some U.S. Treasuries in exchange for that uh, that deval. It doesn't seem like conge- I know we're putting the puzzle pieces together, but I think it begins to make sense for sure. I guess I want to pivot to in that case the BTFP itself, the Bank Term Funding Program. Um, of course, the latest in a long line of acronyms uh, created by the uh, the Federal Reserve and the powers that be. Um, in order to stave off the the latest crisis, of course, which was the crisis that we saw in March, um, with uh, particularly with regional banks, I'll uh, I'll turn your attention to this chart here if I could pull it up, which is the BTFP rate and the S and P five hundred. So of course the BTFP rate is just the um, the the rate on offer for uh, for parking your U.S. Treasuries at the Bank Term Funding Program. Of course this is a loan facility, but this rate rising means that the usage of it is rising too. Um, the bank term funding program for those unaware, and Michael may explain it a little bit better than I, but it's essentially a facility where banks can take their devalued U.S. treasuries and they're not trading at par. They can bring them to this facility and then they can receive par value in return. Uh, now this has the net effect so far, which is observable in the S&P 500 of delaying the you know, risk averse behavior that you would see if banks were holding on to distressed assets. They're taking distressed assets, swapping them for assets at full value, and then receiving, as a result of that, um, risk taking is sort of supported throughout markets. Um, and you can see this with as the usage of the BTFP rises, which is seen in the rate as it increases, the S&P 500 rises too. Now, Michael, you've referred to this as stealth QE. Talk to us about this. Is this stealth QE? Is this the Fed's way of having its cake and eating it too, keeping policy tight with interest rates, but uh, making sure that banks don't crumble under the weight of them? Well, I think it is. I mean, I you know, I think you you described the uh, BTFP very well there. Uh, I'm not much I can add, I think, to your description. But you know, broadly speaking, this comes under a general banner of stealth QE, and uh, broadly, what you've got going on is i mean you can see it very much in the data not even just looking at this but looking at other things such as the size of the reverse repo uh the reverse repo facility which is effectively a withdrawal of liquidity from the markets uh, has been tanking i mean it's been dropping uh precipitously in the last few weeks um and you know current rates of decline the uh, the reverse repo which peaked at about two and a half trillion uh, if this current decline rate continues, it'll be under a trillion dollars by the end of September. Now, it may not. I mean, it, clearly things may, may may interrupt that decline. But at the end of the day, what you've seen is a dramatic fall in the size of that reverse repo. Now, one of the things that has occurred is the Treasury has been targeting money funds, money market funds with bill issuance. And the very fact that a they're doing that, they're issuing a lot of bills. And the fact that they're directly marketing to the money funds, uh, tenors such as three months and six months, which the money funds prefer, uh, tells you they must, at the, back, at the end of the day, be concerned about liquidity in the markets. Uh, and everything that the Fed and the Treasury are doing together, and I stress doing together because I think there are joint efforts here, uh, are trying to maintain levels of liquidity in markets. Uh, that includes aspects such as moving uh, towards bill issuance, uh, more than coupon issuance. Uh, it's things like, uh, you know, letting the reverse repo drop. It's maybe slowing down their, uh, the rate at which coupons are, uh, are sold from the or rolled off the treasury balance sheet. Uh, it's factors like talking about uh, treasury buybacks, which admittedly haven't occurred yet, but may occur next year. These are all attempts to improve market liquidity. And I think if you come back to the statement I made earlier on about how the British guilt crisis of a wake-up call. Uh, what we saw in the wake of that, particularly uh, moving into the SVB problems, is that volatility in the bond markets, in other words, take the move index as one very good measure of bond volatility, spiked. Now, uh, when, I, when I was uh, you know, working in the bond markets, uh, anything over 150 on that move index uh, was considered sort of end of the world stuff. Uh, we peaked at over 200 uh, this year. So that gives you some idea of the degree of volatility in the bond markets. Uh, and I think as a rough rule of thumb, and this is a rule of thumb, if you knock uh, a zero off that 200 to get to 20, that is telling you the sort of uh, implied volatility 
in the bond market. So at twenty percent, it was equivalent to you know equities uh, during periods of uh, you know uh, of volatility. So you've got a lot of volatility. What you'd normally expect is that move in next to be about seventy. Now what we where we are now is that that's fallen back to about a hundred a region of about one hundred and ten or thereabouts on the move index. And that fall in bond volatility is very important. I think it's being deliberately or it's let's say deliberately being engineered or it's being helped by the authorities. They want bond volatility to come down. I think all these uh, examples you give, such as the BTFP, et cetera, the RRP, all these acronyms are moving in that direction. But generally speaking, if you get bond volatility down, that is a big plus for global liquidity because so much liquidity is now created on the back of collateral and collateral, the effective use of collateral depends on uh, bond volatility and the size of haircuts that credit providers actually give uh, or, or, or add to uh, uh, to collateral. So in other words, if you take a bond at, uh, at uh, value 1000 uh, and you want to borrow against that, um, the credit provider may give you a haircut of 5%. So you're effectively, your collateral is worth 950, not 1000. But if there's a lot more volatility in the system, uh, you're going to get 900 or 850 for that, not, uh, uh, not the 950. And what you can see here is the very close correlation in the chart you've put up between what we call the collateral multiplier or changes in the collateral multiplier, which is basically how base money is translated within the world financial system into global liquidity and the move index in the US. And basically what it says is the move index is shown inverted on that right hand scale. If the move index spikes higher, what you find is the collateral multiplier collapses and that's a big dent in global liquidity. So basically what we've got at the moment is a situation where hopefully bond volatility is now stabilizing and maybe even falling. So that would give some impetus to uh, a higher collateral multiplier. We've got base money, which is basically beginning to move up uh, for a number of reasons. The Fed is inching liquidity in. Uh, the PBOC is probably going to come back. The BOJ is adding liquidity, etc. You've got other central banks that are benefiting from uh, increasing dollar holdings, which they can monetize. So that's a further heads up to more liquidity. And then you've got the collateral base, which is itself stabilizing or increasing, uh, which is further impetus. So all in all, I can see some good reasons why liquidity goes up. And I'm not yet persuaded uh, by the consensus view that liquidity is crashing. I don't think it is. You guys already know the drill. We take self-custody very seriously here at the Bitcoin layer. If you're not having your Bitcoin in cold storage or holding it on your own, you're not using Bitcoin the way it was intended to, right? At the end of the day, you need to be taking your Bitcoin off of exchanges, which in the case of crypto exchanges can often be very dangerous and move them onto a cold storage solution. And that's why for a long while, we've been partners with Foundation Devices. They are the creators of the Passport this is the most intuitive Bitcoin hardware wallet on the market. It looks just like a cell phone. It has a very visible, very clear and vibrant screen. So you'll know exactly what's going on. You'll take this out of the box. You'll know how to use it immediately. And if hardware wallets aren't your thing, if you're just getting into Bitcoin cold storage, then no worries. They also have Envoy, which is a free and easy to use mobile wallet that you can download for free on Google Play or the iOS app store and take your Bitcoin off exchanges in seconds. Literally, it took me less than two minutes to set up Envoy and get my Bitcoin off of all my exchanges. It works like a charm. If you've been on the fence of taking your Bitcoin off of exchanges, look no further. The most powerful account management and the most privacy in the most intuitive package comes with Foundation Devices. So go to the link in the description to foundationdevices.com to either purchase a passport or download Envoy for free on the iOS App Store or Google Play. And now back to the video. Very well said. This chart in particular was really insightful. The uh, change in collateral multiplier and the move index uh, inverted. And it uh it certainly makes a whole lot of sense, right? Um, you know, people are less likely to lend uh, against this pristine collateral, and there thereby there will be more liquidity if that collateral, these U.S. Treasuries, are are super volatile. Um, it was very it was very prescient to you the first time that we talked, um, saying that you know the Fed would in all likelihood uh, stave off volatility in the bond market with a, a facility not unlike what the, the United Kingdom did. And that's seemingly the strategy here. This the strategy is seemingly maintain uh, the value of U.S. Treasuries, try to try to make it such that they're not moving all over the place, um, so that you know banks are banks are held, uh, you know banks don't implode, right? Like we saw in the United Kingdom, um, while also keeping policy rates high. So sort of trying to manage and, and have their cake and eat it too. 
uh, one question I have here about um, the global economy, the world economy. Uh, you've said that the world economy is already well into recession. Uh, right now, uh, especially from market pundits, talking heads, you turn on Bloomberg TV, the growing consensus seems to be soft landing. Uh, it seems to be that uh, the, the Fed, Powell, has effectively managed their way to bring CPI inflation back down to its 2% target, which now that it's in its 2% handle, they seem to have done, uh, while not creating this huge unwind in the labor market uh, and this, this global growth downturn. Uh, what's your view on that? Of course, business surveys have plunged. ISM surveys are in the toilet. Um, what's your view on whether or not we see some kind of unwind in the labor market? Well, I think the first thing to say is it looks by all accounts that there is uh, a soft landing in the sense that uh, uh, the worst uh, dimensions of recession will be staved off. Uh, I mean, that's always been our view anyway. But I think the, you know, the fact is that if you come back to the inflation story, inflation was probably half to do with cost pressures and half to do with excess demand created by uh, the huge inflow of money that the federal uh, authorities basically dished into the economy uh, to help with COVID. So you've got two moving parts there. Cost inflation pressures tend to be self-correcting. So, you know, half that inflation impulse was anyway going to disappear. And then by putting the brakes on, the Federal Reserve seems to have done quite a good job in actually getting uh, the other part of inflation, the demand that inflation down. Now, I think if you start to track uh, measures of inflation, and we look at a, at a slightly unusual one, but it's one that I think has worked for us and it's uh, it's got uh, uh, plausibility behind it, which is the pass-through of inflation shocks. What you find is that the pass-through of inflation shocks in the US, which basically uh, peaked at about 32 months uh, in 2021, and that basically was saying that if you get an inflation shock today, it will perpetrate through the pricing structure uh, in the US for almost three years. I mean, you can see it on the chart, I think you're putting up there. I mean, this is just uh, for those that are wonkish enough, this is an auto correlation coefficient uh, estimated. But basically what it shows is the impact uh, on the US pricing structure of, of uh, inflation shocks. And it goes right back to the 1950s. And what this basically says is that the time when Volcker came in, uh, in, uh, in 1979, what you saw was that data was peaking or close to peaking uh, at around uh, or very close to five years. So in other words, if there was an inflation shock uh, in 1980, it would basically perpetrate and ripple through the US pricing structure for another five years. And that clearly was a, was a, bad, was a bad scene. Uh, it took Volcker about five years to get that, to get those inflation expectations down, compressed. Uh, what you've seen now is actually Joe Powell has done a pretty good job by the looks of things. You can see there in the latest spike that it went up to 30, just over 32 months in 2021. It's right down to 10 months now, and I think it's falling fast. So that's really saying that any inflation shock, uh, if we get a shock today, it will last in the pricing structure what seems to be 10 months, but it's progressively diminishing. And I would suspect it's going to come down to uh, the long term average of about three or four months uh, pretty soon. And that's telling us inflation is coming out of the system fast. Now, as regards what does that mean? Um, I think that it means that stock markets or risk assets are very well supported uh, because they like low inflation. And one of the things that we've been maintaining uh, for a long time now is to say, look, valuation measures, uh, P's if you like, uh, are very dependent on inflation expectations or the inflation outlook. And you can see that right through the data, whether you look at long term data from, for example, Robert Sheila's database, you look at our data, it's very clear that if you get inflation rates down, equity exposure tends to rise, P multiples go up. And another way to look at this is to say, let's take a look at the business surveys that you've currently got you know, coming out in the US, things like the Philadelphia Fed or the New York Empire State surveys. What they basically survey is both output expectations, in other words, how much growth in the economy have you got, and also pricing expectations, what about prices paid? Now, the interesting thing is that if you plot the differential between those two factors, which I showed, which you, you're, you've got on the chart that we've uh, sent over, uh, what that tracks in black is the differential between the PMI, the Purchasing Managers Index, in other words, the headline for growth in the economy, minus 
the price is paid question. And that has been advanced by 12 months. And you can see alongside in orange is the year on year change in the S&P 500. Now, the key point about this is providing that the that inflation expectations, prices paid, fall at a faster rate than the economy contracts, that black line is going to go up. Uh, it also goes up if the economy expands faster than prices go up. And that's pretty much the reality that we've got at the moment. Prices paid are falling at a faster rate than the economy is contracting. The black line is going up and that's giving a positive impetus to the market. So what you can say is that why are stocks higher? They're higher because liquidity is expanded and because inflation has come down. That's not a puzzle. That's what that's how markets work. And I'm sort of, you know, I'm always left head scratching when I pick up, you know, the media or look at the, the recent uh, uh, recent editions of the Financial Times in London, which basically say, you know, well, why is the or look on Bloomberg? Why is the market going up? It's all because we haven't had all these things like recession or we haven't had uh, earnings disappointments. Well, it, it's not that's not the reason. The reason is plain and simple. Liquidity has gone up and inflation has come down. Uh, the market is quite logical in that regard. and It's gone up accordingly. If any of those two factors change, so if liquidity changes direction or inflation starts to reaccelerate, then OK, we'll change our view. But for the moment, the market's going up. And that's what I think is really critical to understand. Inflation for the moment is coming down. There is a bad side to this because in the long term, we've got a threat to the inflation or the price uh, integrity of many economies, including the US. And that is because central banks are being compelled to add liquidity in the medium term because they're going to have to start funding governments. And if you think of the last uh, six months as being a period where the Federal Reserve has been bailing out the regional banks, well, you know, <laughs> look forward to the period in the next few years and they're going to be bailing out the federal government. And that's the reality. And, you know, this is not a, you know, I'm not, um, you know, uh, weighing in on the US in any shape or form. The US is the cleanest shirt in the laundry here. Many other countries are in really bad, a really, really bad way. So, you know, what you've got to expect is monetary inflation. Now, the US can maybe get out of that to some extent, to the extent that it can persuade China to keep buying treasuries. The alternative is to say, well, OK, if we can't do that, either the Federal Reserve has got to come back in uh, and buy treasuries. And that's certainly the view of the Congressional Budget Office, because that's in the projections that the Congressional Budget Office makes. Uh, looking out for the next 10 years. Uh, they may be conservative assumptions and the reality may be a lot worse than that. But the fact is the Fed comes back. Or the other thing is that the private sector is compelled to buy treasuries. Uh, and that's the other uh, situation you've got to start thinking about. Now, already you can see, in fact, on the graph that you show there, that uh, the US annual interest expense is this skyrocketing. And that's against a period where interest rates have been low. You've got to remember in Japan at the moment where you've got, you know, very, very low interest rates. The interest bill that the Japanese government pays is 25 percent of its current expenditure or very close to it. So you can see that this problem is not just a U.S. problem uh, and it's probably a lot worse in many other countries. But the only way out of this is basically for the Federal Reserve to come back in and buy treasuries. You, the alternative, you might say, is, well, what about the private sector uh, coming back and forcing the private sector to buy debt? Pr problem with that is, is that you're likely to force interest rates higher. And if you force interest rates higher, then you're on a knife edge because your interest expense starts to absolutely spiral higher. So as far as I can see, there's absolutely no way out here. Um, you've got a situation where monetary inflation is going to be the order of the day in the medium term. Monetary inflation supports asset markets because it spills over into assets. Investors like a hedge uh, against the threat of monetary inflation. So they go into assets. Uh, they go into things like precious metals. They go into equities, providing uh, high street inflation is not that is not too high. And they also go into cryptocurrencies. And that's what I think you've got to start to expect more and more of. They do not go into fixed income. Mm. They do not go into fixed income, indeed. I think we, you know, it's it's interesting. I think we're we may be entering into a a, a different regime. We've had fifty some odd years uh, of uh, of down only on. Let's let's take the ten year for example. Um, you know, going from fifteen something percent all the way down to uh, what's it in a three handle, a four handle right now. Um, and uh, really, we're at the zero lower bound. There's there's not a whole uh, 
there isn't many other places to go yet the government still needs to fund itself and so um you know if if all this debt issuance is coming out and the the private sector isn't the the people who are going to buy it and granted like you said the us is the, the cleanest shirt in the laundry um of course us treasuries have this entrenched demand but um you know over time if the private sector is going to be less and less of a player but of course the government is still growing and still needs to fund itself and particularly with this ever rising interest expense does seem like the Fed is going to have to be a player of some kind uh, in the market here. Um, uh, one one final question for you, I suppose, um, and then of course I'll, I'll leave the floor to you to talk about uh, other relevant topics um, as well as uh, anything the viewers should know about uh, the upcoming uh, outlook on uh, you know global markets, financial markets, and the real economy as well. Is um, we talk about how central bankers do not like deflation, right? They hate inflation. Of course, they've been battling that for the last year. But deflation um, is also something that keeps them up at night. As of right now, we've seen 12 straight months of down only completely swift consumer price disinflation from 9.1% now to 2.97%, rounded up to 3%. Um, at, in your mind right now, are there risks, given the last 12 months and the speed at which we've seen that price uh, disinflation, are there risks of deflation in your view? Um, and if so, how does the Fed uh, and the US government manage around that? Yes, there are, there are risks clearly of deflation. And I think you can add to that by looking at what's going on, going on in China right now, because China's got deflation. Uh, I think the, you know, the interesting thing as well to conjecture is that what you're seeing is that uh, input prices, uh, producer prices are falling at an even faster rate uh, than high street prices. Now, that may tell us something about profit margins. So, you know, I would surmise in a very simplistic way that actually corporate profits are not going to be anything like as ugly as people maintain. For this reason, anyway, because you've got that uh, uh, you've got that that differential growing, but I think that generally deflation uh, could well be a problem um, in you know maybe within six months' time. Now, the the sort of uh, I suppose the the positive news is that that will allow the central banks to expand liquidity again. I don't think they're going to slash interest rates, and I think that's that's been my long held view. Because I think the problem is that we've uh, we've used interest rates too much with with uh, you know or too much too often, and we've let interest rates fall to ridiculously low levels. Uh, when central banks, I would I would venture, made a big mistake uh, in the early two uh, thousands uh, after China's entry into the World Trade Organization, when you actually got a lot of cost deflation, uh, central bankers then misread that for uh, monetary inflation. They got scared. And they slashed interest rates. And the problem with slashing interest rates to near zero, and after all, we've had pretty much, you know, almost 15 years of this policy, is that it incentivizes debt. Now, the amount of debt the world economy has taken on is eye-watering. I mean, it's ridiculous amounts. You're talking about $350 trillion. So, you know, getting close to three and a half times world GDP. And that debt, uh, believe it or not, has to be refinanced. And the point that we keep making, which is what the textbooks and economists tend to miss in all this, uh, in my humble opinion, is that the global financial system is a refinancing system now, not a new financing system. And a refinancing system needs balance sheet capacity. If you've got to refinance something like $70 trillion of debt each year, uh, which is this assuming a, a five-year maturity on that 350, uh, you're going to rough to roll 70 trillion, you need balance sheet space, balance sheet capacity to do that. And that's liquidity. Doesn't matter so much about what the interest bill is. Uh, you know, think of it as a, as a home mortgage. I mean, if you can't roll your home mortgage, you're homeless. Uh, if you can't uh, honor your corporate debt, roll it over, uh, you're going to default. OK, it doesn't matter necessarily what the interest rate is, but it really does matter whether you can get the roll. And the point here is that, uh, you know, you need liquidity. So as debt expands, you need more and more liquidity in the system. And that liquidity is fungible and it tends to spill over into other areas, notable asset price inflation. We happen to like asset price inflation, uh, it, particularly if you're a wealth holder. If you're not a wealth holder, you've got a problem. But that's the way that's the way the world works at the moment. Now, this is the world that we're entering into. And therefore, I think that, you know, in my view, central banks simply cannot afford to slash interest rates. 
Now, against that background, they're going to have to raise debt. They're going to have to issue debt. We know that. Coupon issuance is going up significantly because of the very bad fiscal arithmetic uh, out there. And so what you're going to get is a risk premium or so-called term premium, which is maybe a wonkish concept to many, but it's the risk premium uh, on a bond. Uh, term premium, which are hugely negative at the moment. I mean, this is the, the big mispricing in markets that people haven't jumped on board at. You know, normally the term premium on the U.S. Treasury market is either zero or a small positive. Currently, it's about minus 180 basis points. So in other words, the 10 year yield should, in theory, be 180 basis points higher than it is right now. But it's not because of term premium. And I would argue that's simply occurring because there's a shortage of collateral in the system. Now, that will be addressed as there's more issuance coming through. So what you've got out there is the prospect that the U.S. Treasury yield um, you know, may come down if the Federal Reserve decides to cut interest rates. But what you gain from lower policy rate expectations, you're going to lose with a higher term premium uh, odds are. So in my view, the bond markets are awash. And that's why for the last six or nine months, we've been arguing that the U.S. Treasury 10 year is likely range bound um, as far as we can see. Uh, that's the best you can hope for. It, it, at this stage of the cycle, bonds are not a great investment. Typically, they're not a bad investment. If you get the carry, get the coupon. But they're certainly not. A, they're, they're not the shoot the light bulbs out that some people have been claiming. Phenomenal balance sheet capacity above all else. Um, and as we enter into this new regime, central banks will have to play an, an increased role in making sure that that balance sheet capacity is there. Because as you say, the global economy is a refinancing mechanism. Phenomenal. Um, one last question. I know I said that, that was the last question, but with that in mind, uh, there have been some pundits out there calling for uh, the S&P 500 to go to 5,400 um, with all of you know these factors to consider. Um, what happens to to asset prices over the next six to 12 months, given the fact that uh, global liquidity is on the rise and given all the factors you stated, it seems like it will continue to rise, maybe even at an accelerating rate. What happens to asset prices over the next, uh, you know, over this leg of the cycle that's coming up? Well, providing that liquidity expands and assuming that inflation doesn't deteriorate too much um, over that time frame. I think what you've got is the prospect of, uh, of asset prices going up. Now, as we keep cautioning, asset prices never move in a straight line, neither does liquidity. And so you, you've got to be cognizant of that. But the fact is that we've got a situation where, unlike 2022, the wind is behind us, not in front of us. And you've got to invest with that in mind. It's always worth thinking about what things will look like in 12 months or 18 months time rather than right now because the financial markets are forward looking, uh, forward discounting mechanisms. They look forward, uh, you know, don't rely on economists because economists, uh, you know, uh, are, are, not the, uh, are not the best at forecasting economies. Uh, the financial markets have got much, much better track record. Uh, and if you look at what the stock markets are saying, they're telling us that there's likely to be some recovery in economies. Uh, you know, an, another thing you can, uh, well, you, you've got my chart in front of you, which is looking at the long-term cycle in liquidity. And that basically is saying, you know, you can see pretty clearly there from the black line, which is the reality of liquidity, that it doesn't move in straight lines, but it moves very roughly, uh, sort of metronome like in these sort of cycles, which last, you know, about uh, 60 to 70 months. And it looks as if the next peak uh, is going to be around, uh, what, 2026 or thereabouts. Now, in case I'm being accused of cheating, I didn't put that, that uh, dotted line on. Uh, after the event. In actual fact, we drew that dotted line, the sine wave, about 15 years ago, and we've been updating it ever since. So it's, it's what you see is what you get, but it's been pretty much tracking closely that global liquidity cycle uh, you know, through time. Now, to come back to the economy, I think one of the things to think about in terms of how the economy is likely to look is to look within the economy at sectors. And one of the best indicators of what the economy's health is, is to read the entrails of the market and look at the performance of cyclical stocks versus defensive stocks. Now, Stan Druckermiller, the famous uh, investor, uh, you know, basically once said that my, the best economist I've got is the internals of the stock market. And he used a very similar metric, which is looking at cyclicals versus defensives. And if you look at the performance of cyclicals versus defensives, uh, it's basically outperforming, they're outperforming significantly. 
and it's entirely consistent with a turn in the economy uh, around about now. So we're somewhat at the low point. So what I would say is, you know, don't just take my word for it. Don't take one data series. Start looking at a range of data series. Look at things like uh, the New York Empire State Survey of Business. Look at the uh, Philadelphia Fed Survey of Business. These are very, very good uh, indicators through their PMI indexes. Look at things like, uh, uh, you know, look at uh, things like shipping uh, what's going on in the shipping markets. Look at something like uh, throughput for LA ports, which gives you a pretty good idea about what's happening in the Pacific trade. Uh, look at things like the CAS indicator of transportation. This is pretty good fundamental of the economy, looking at what transportation is doing. All these things are basically, as far as I can see, forming some sort of bottom right now. Don't say we won't get another down leg. Always possible. OK, markets always climb a wall of worry, remember, but it looks as if you're getting some sort of bottoming out. And I think that's playing into the narrative of a soft landing. Inflation's down. Why should the Federal Reserve you know, want to create a banking crisis and tighten more now? Uh, they've pretty much got, you know, they can talk, they can use open mouth operations to talk inflation down. But there's no need to uh, actually physically tighten uh, the markets a lot more, in my view. I think they've already done that and they've done what seems to be a pretty good job. So what I would say is, you know, uh, think about the wind behind us. Start thinking about an 18 month view about where to invest, where you'd like to invest, what should your should, what your portfolio should be look like. And I would suggest things like equities still look pretty decent to me. You may want to diversify into other markets, maybe look at Asia. Uh, you know, China looks phenomenally cheap uh, as, an, as an investment, but, you know, maybe that's not flavor of the month. Japan should do pretty well. Uh, Warren Buffett's already taken, uh, you know, uh, has already moved out there in uh, in size, so he can see something. Uh, and you know, I still come back to the old favourites of, you know, crypto looks pretty good in an environment where there's monetary inflation, as do precious metals. Fantastic. After several months, well over a year of the Fed raising policy interest rates, doing its best to bring price inflation down to target, it is all but done. That Powell has all but accomplished his mission. The mission is now balance sheet capacity, maintaining that making sure the banks don't go belly up. The wind is now behind us, as you say, Michael. Thank you so much again for coming on the show. We always really appreciate your insights. Before we sign off here, where can people find you? Well, there's various uh, various conduits. We've got uh, a sub stack, which is called Capital Wars. We've got a Twitter handle, which is Cross Border Cap. And we've got a website, which is crossbordercapital.com. All right. Fantastic. Viewers, you know what to do. Go subscribe, go follow, go bookmark that website. And of course, if you haven't already subscribed, make sure you do and you hit the notification bell so you get notified for tremendous episodes as soon as they drop, just like this one. Michael, thanks again. Thanks, Joe. Special thanks to River for sponsoring this channel and this video. You can buy Bitcoin with zero fees when you set up a DCA. They have a proprietary multi-sig cold storage solution, so all your Bitcoin is held there and not held anywhere else. So you know you can rest with peace of mind knowing that your Bitcoin is safe. And also, if you want to set up a mining rig without the hassle and the headache of doing it on your own, they have a turnkey mining service solution where you could purchase a miner, set it up, and then mine Bitcoin all from the comfort of your own computer. You can get started today with River by visiting river.com or by clicking the link in the video description below for a special offer.